it's a, it's really a, a, a collaborative collaborative effort between the administration and the political leadership, depending on the on the topic. I mean, if you talk about the role of a member, you would uh, want to hear another member talk about that. How do you become effective as a member? You don't want to hear another member talk about that. If you talk about the engagement of a member with the media, you may want your communications uh, expert to talk about that. If you talk about the legislative process, you might you might want a, a secretary to the house or your legal people um, or people who run with committees to talk about that. But but that is a that is a detail that will be dealt with once we have the political leadership of parliament, establishment of this parliament. People may or may not be aware that the budget has not been passed yet. The national budget. So one of the primary responsibilities of this a new parliament as it comes into existence will be to attend to the issue of the budget, um, which must be passed before the end of July or by the end of July. Um, parliament is ready for the new members, ready for all the processes, whether you're talking about the swearing in of the new members, whether you talk about the setting up of the structures. Parliament is ready for that. You are still watching Parliament TV's live coverage of the first sitting of the National Assembly. I am standing with one of the new members of Parliament. Good afternoon, sir. Congratulations for making it to Parliament. If you can just introduce yourself for our viewers and also indicate which political party you're representing. Yes, my name is uh, John Belankulu from the African National Congress in Lipombo. My branch is uh, under Guyana ANC Bridges. What is the mandate of your political party for this parliament? My mandate is to be part of the implementation of the manifesto of the African National Congress. And what are some of the key issues that you expect to see happening in this sixth parliament? <laughs> to make sure that we provide services to the different communities in South Africa as an African National Congress. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bilankolu. There it was, Mr. Bilankolu, one of the new members of the African National Congress who has just been sworn in as a member of parliament. We will now be crossing back to the studio. Uh, viewers at home, we've just came back now from our presenter, Tim Rigosi, who's interacting with the different members of the different political parties and also their newly sworn in members of the National Assembly. One of the most important things as viewers of South Africa and as voters as well is that your vote is your voice. You could not be here, but you've elected representatives through your political party to be your voice here in Parliament. So in that, you are saying they must come and speak to issues that affect you as communities. You must remember that earlier on with Mr. Mansura, we spoke about the role of the National Assembly and oversight. Oversight is one of the most important key f functions of the members of the National Assembly, especially because it deals with issues of services, it deals with things that legislation that has been passed by Parliament, it gets to be implemented by the executive or government. And if that does not happen, you as citizens have a right to take it to Parliament and indicate that you are expressing dissatisfaction in terms of the services that the executive or government has supposedly supposed to have rendered to you as communities. And also, you as citizens, you have a right to participate in the lawmaking process of, of the Parliament. National Remember Assembly. that the role uh, Mr. Mansour, we've just or seen the, the members one of the being sworn in, the excitement, the others seem to the be National quite anxious Assembly about is to make and to pass national laws that govern my country, Minister of country, Health, Mr. South Aaron Africa. And if you do not participate, you would know, you wouldn't know exactly how then you need to be involved. So as the public, as the voters of these members of parliament who have been recently been sworn in, you also take your responsibility. So as the citizens today, we are bringing you live the sitting of the National Assembly of the sixth parliament 
where the members of the National Assembly were sworn in. Also, what you need to remember as citizens, the chamber that you saw is the inside of the National Assembly where all the 400 members of that represent the 14 political parties get to sit where they discuss issues that relate to our country. They discuss issues that pertain to the legislations of our country. So you as a citizen, you need to keep yourself informed by following the work of parliament through your Twitters, through the Facebook, uh, through the Instagram, as well as YouTube, because that will give you an idea as to how your country is progressing, how your country or how your parliament is progressing to ensure that the lives of South Africans improved and they get better. Remember that citizens, before we, the members of parliament went on a break, they just had sworn in 400 members of the National Assembly. And then the process that we ended on, or the Chief Justice concluded on, was that the, we had two nominations, two nominations of people who are going to be the speaker, or the person who's going to be the speaker of the National Assembly. To remind you viewers, the two nominations are Ms. Tandi Modise and Mr. Uh, Richard Majola. Those are the two nomination, nominations we have. So as the break has been taken, it is to prepare the chamber and also the voting that's going to happen, which is not something that happens if the National Assembly has received one nomination for the speaker. But because we have two nominations, then the members of the National Assembly are going to go through a voting process. One of the things that was highlighted by Mr. Mansura, he had indicated that this break, it allows the table staff to go and prepare the ballot papers of which the members are going to use when they elect or when they decide to vote who becomes the speaker. And in that process, they are going to do that as well alphabetically. Once that has been concluded, then the Chief Justice is going to announce who the speaker of the National Assembly is. And then after that, Mr. Mansura, after lunch, we're going to unpack the characteristics that they look at when they look at the speaker, as well as the role of the speaker, as well as the role of the deputy speaker. Because remember, in the absence of the speaker, there must be a deputy. And also, if both of them are not in the house, who then takes over? and preside over the houses. So viewers at home, that is just a brief of what is going to come later on. So as we are busy bringing this live broadcast to you at home, wherever you are in the country, we are now going to go out to Tem Gossi, who is going to give us more information about the members of the National Assembly. Tem Gossi. You are still watching the live coverage of the first sitting of the National Assembly. With me is Ms. Lisuma. Ma'am, good afternoon. Congratulations for making back to Parliament. And what can we expect to see different this time around? Good afternoon, Tembi. Uh, what we are going to see different is what the AS in terms of our manifesto was prioritized in terms of uh, running with it, uh, trying and correct all the wrongs of the past administratively to make sure that we hold the uh, executive accountable and ensure that we service our communities and we give them timeless feedback on issues and they also participate in all what we do. And what are some of the key issues that you'd like to see being prioritized in the sixth parliament? As all of us were aware that the, the cabinet is going to be smaller or slimmer, which means then more funds will be going directed to the service, service deliver in terms of the basic services, your water in particular, and also the electricity and road infrastructure so that we can attract uh, investors also to, so that there could be job uh, creation boosting. All right, thank you very much, ma'am, and we wish you all the best during the sixth parliament. Thank you so much. <laughs> there it was, we were speaking to Ms. Lisuma one of the returning members of parliament, and I will now be speaking to a returning member once again, <laughs> Ms. Pumzile Fandam, and a new member who will introduce herself to our viewers. Yes, my name is Siviwe Kwakule, and I'm newly elected as of this afternoon. 
Well, congratulations, ma'am. If you can share with us how are you feeling, what is your party's mandate for the third term of parliament, and what are some of the key issues that you'd like to see being prioritized in this term? Well, I'm very excited for my second term. Um, I think my first term was very exciting. Um, we got to work on the SABC tackling corruption, um, and I think um, we kind of helped stabilize the SABC, but there's still work to be done there. So I hope I get to go back to the communications portfolio committee. I think our message as the DA um, process the election is about the realignment of politics. Um, we're seeing growing nationalism from both sides. So we want to kind of maintain the center um, as a liberal party, as a party that talks about non-racialism, a party that talks about united South Africa, because no other party talks about that. Um, they all represent specific races, so we want to bring um, all the different races together. Um, so that is kind of our message and mandate going forward. So maybe we can speak to some of the issues that uh, we will be prioritizing this parliament. Uh, Honourable Member, we do know that you led the DA communications during the election campaign. Were you happy with the result? And what is it that we can expect to see being addressed, particularly challenges relating to the youth? Yeah, thanks. I think, yeah, look, I mean, I think youth unemployment is a big um, agenda of ours as we get into the CIS Parliament. I think as an organisation, we realise that this is more of a crisis and that you know it becomes a non-partisan issue and we all need to rally behind finding solutions, whether it be legislative reform, um, whether it, it will be policy interventions, but it's urgent. And young people, who half of them who are in, in the age of employment are high without a job. And so it's urgent and it's important and that's a big mandate that we're going in with. And of course, the DA has been um, very well known around holding the executive to account. We will continue in that vein. There are certain urgent matters which we want to prioritize um, regarding, for instance, the public protector, um, which was something that we drove uh, vigorously in the Fifth Parliament, and we want to continue those things because it's important that we look after the, our institutions as much as possible. In terms of the election results, I think it's very important for us to accept um, the, the elections and the choices that uh, South Africans have made. I think and millions of South Africans have put faith in the DA, um, and also we remain in government uh, for over 15 million South Africans. And so our goal now, between now and 2021, is to strengthen those, um, the way we govern and to win more measures. Ms. Pandam, Ms. Nguenya spoke about holding the executive accountable. What advice or comments do you have for the presiding officers of the sixth parliament? Uh, firstly, can you let us speak? Um, can you manage the house? Um, for example, I've never delivered a speech without continuous interruptions. I once went to deliver a five minute speech and I ended up being at the podium for 15. So I, can ho I hope they can maintain order. I hope they can foster an environment where we can debate ideas. Um, and Parliament shouldn't be a circus. Um, I think the people of South Africa want to see their MPs working, not shouting and you know, raising uh, points of orders. They want to see us talking about the problems that they're facing. They want to see us talking about unemployment. They want to see us talking about improving their lives. So I hope that the residing officers would create such environments so we can talk about the important issues and finding solutions to the problems that pe the people of South Africa face. Well, we can't run away from the fact that currently the ANC has the majority of the members of parliament, but before the break we saw two nominations for the position of the speaker, one coming from the ANC and one coming from the DA. Are we likely to see anything happening when the House reconvenes again? Well, 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 we hope the ANC will make the right choice and vote for the DA candidate. <laughs> and ultimately, look, the DA has been, over the past decade, been a big proponent of saying that we need a uh, party. And so uh, it's not just about a numbers game, it's about following through with what we've said. That we've always believed that different speakers from di uh, presiding officers from different political parties will ultimately foster a, 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 a spirit of debate a spirit of holding the executive to account. And so that's why we've made the stand today and nominated Richard Majola um, as a presiding officer. And so we hope that uh, other members of the House will also feel the same way.
I would not be doing any justice if I would not allow you to send out a message to the youth out there. We'll start with you, Ms. Van Damme. Well, I must want to say that the air benches are full of young, talented people like Ziwe, uh, Adria Youth uh, Leader Luolo. So there's a lot of outspoken, very smart, educated young people who are here and we will, will be representing the voice of the young people. So I want to say to the young people of South Africa, rest assured, the DA is here. Uh, we are going to be tackling issues that face young people head on. We want an improved uh, higher education system. We want an improved basic education system. We want to make sure that our young people get jobs. I mean, South Africa has one of the highest youth unemployment rates. So I want to say to them, uh, DA MPs will be here fighting fit for them. Uh, and not only just uh, in the role of opposing, but going into committee and make sh making sure that legislation is made that uh, you know, uh, makes the, li the lives of young people better. So we'll be here, we'll be fighting for them. I think it's important from my side to say to encourage young people to get involved and, and make themselves available for public office. I think it's high time South Africa changes the face of public office um, because for too long it has been very much a very old male dominated space. I think that as a country that has so many young people, it's important that we become part of the solution and that we put ourselves at the decision making table. And so that's what we're going to say. We're saying to young people that we're here to represent your voice, but we also need you to come on board to make yourselves available for public office and let's not be bystanders um, in our own country. Once again, congratulations for making it to Parliament and congratulations to you, Ms. Van Damme, for returning to Parliament. Young people, that it's Parliament of the people. So they're allowed to um, come and give comment on legislation so they, they, they don't have to just be spectators. Um, there's different ways to participate in Parliament. So put, uh, you know, comments on legislation, submit documents. So, you know, we are public representatives, so we are open to the public and they must, if they have issues, they must uh, speak to us. Thank you very much, ladies, and I wish you all the best. There it was, our uh, viewers at home, Ms. Van Damme and Ms. Nguenya, both members of parliament for the Democratic Alliance. We will now be crossing back to the studio. Uh, thank you very much, Tim Kosi. Uh, several conversations there and in our observation and what we've heard the newly sworn in members mention. I will just start with Ms. Van, da Van Damme who comments that this is an open parliament. They represent the citizens of South Africa. She urged the youth to start taking a role in the legislative processes of parliament and then that then indicates that as well they are here to serve you as the citizens of the country and back to being an open parliament something that most people have seen either as Tim Gossi is standing there on the steps there are inscriptions that have been made on the steps of the National Assembly. And one of them indicates that the Parliament is an open Parliament. There's openness, meaning that whatever the work of Parliament is doing or the National Assembly, you as citizens have to contribute. And then that brings me to the high-level panel, which was given the responsibility to check the impact of the legislation that was passed in the country since 1994. The, sixth, the fifth parliament has compiled a report, compiled a report, and that report definitely will be handed over to the sixth parliament to see what changes need to be done in terms of ensuring that whatever legislation is passed for you as citizens and I, it gets to be implemented and we understand and that it yields the results that it is meant to be. And then that also brings me to the public participation model. During the fifth parliament, parliament has been hard at work to ensure that it strengthens this participation of the citizens of the country. Mr. Mansura here earlier on mentioned that the constitution indicates that in all the processes of parliament, you as a citizen, you must participate and you must get involved. And that responsibility of making that possible lies with the members 
of the National Assembly as well as the delegate of the National Council of Provinces. And that brings me to the delegates of the National Council of Provinces. As we said earlier on, the very same processes that are unfolding in the National Assembly, they are unfolding at the nine provincial legislators of South Africa because the members, after being sworn in, and then they need to then nominate the delegates, 10 delegates that are going to come and represent the legislatures in the National Council of Provinces. What you saw today in the National Assembly will be unfolding in the National Council of Provinces. Before I elaborate more on these processes and the achievements of the fifth parliament, Tembikos is standing by outside. I am standing here in front of the National Assembly with one of the new members of Parliament. Good afternoon, sir. Congratulations for making it to Parliament. And if you can just introduce yourself to our viewers. It's Jabulo Peganzuza. I'm from uh, the province of KwaZulu Natal. And I'm currently the ANC Youth League Secretary General. Well, Mr. Zuza, if you can just share with our viewers at home what is your party political mandate for the sixth term? Well, ours is that of radical economic transformation to make sure that we redistribute the wealth to benefit the masses of our people, to make sure that the majority of our people who are living in poverty are eradicated from poverty, and that we pursue a social program that balances with our economic program to both use our resources to benefit everyone in this country. And in the main, we are from the African National Congress, and it's the oldest liberation movement here. And as such, we are very proud to be here, to have been selected by the ANC to come and represent it and its policies. And surely ours is to change the lives of our people through driving proper policy that benefits our people. And what are some of the key issues, particularly relating to the youth, that you would like to see being prioritized during this parliamentary term? Well, the issue of the youth is about jobs, to be honest. Eh? Most of our young people do not have jobs because the natural resources that are produced in this country are not creating jobs because they go out of this country without being processed to the final goods. We need to start introducing issues like beneficiation of our own natural resources so that we can have factories in this country that will then open jobs. We need to start looking at innovation and funding innovation, innovative ideas for young people so that they can, government can invest in their dreams and aspirations so that they can be better, they can have a better future. That is only going to happen if government invests in those particular ideas. Free education obviously has been declared, but we need to do more to make sure that we increase the number of people who we intake through increasing institutions of higher education and taking more people to put them through the system. Because free education is not really about being free, but it's an investment for the future that will benefit a number of young people. What message, what message do you have for the young stars out there? And also, what advice do you have for the presiding officers for this term? The message I have for young people is that this sixth parliament looks surely set to make sure that tomorrow will be better than today. And uh, we are going to create a bright future. We hope the presiding officers will give this parliament a decorum that it deserves, such that it becomes a platform for the backdrop of ideas and not for clowning around and making jokes about the lives of our people and political posturing that we have seen over the past couple of years that has been happening here in Parliament. It's about serious business. It's about the lives of the people. And as such, we are not here to clown around. We are here to contribute at an ideological level, at an idea level, and not just making jokes like entering through voters. That is unnecessary, really. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Nzuza, and we wish you all the best during this parliamentary term. There it was, you are Mr. Nzuza, new ANC MP, coming from KwaZulu-Natal, and we will now be going back to the studio. Uh, viewers at home, thank you, Tim Gossi. We've been engaging with the different uh, members of the National Assembly, but back to the National Council of Provinces, as I said earlier on, 
they are swearing in of the new delegates or the new members of the provincial legislatures across the country in preparation for the swearing in of the delegates that are going to be assigned to work in the National Council of Provinces here in the National Parliament. And that process is going to happen. Those proceedings are going to happen tomorrow, round about at the same time, and the same process is going to be respected as well, respectively. Uh, viewers at home, the Chief Justice, as we saw earlier on, the Chief Justice Mukhweng Mukhweng was the one that was presiding through the swearing in of the new members of the National Assembly. And he is also going after lunch to go back and then continue with the nomination that was given earlier on of the speaker. Now the members of the National Assembly are going to exercise their votes in the election of the speaker. And then as well, the speaker will then come back, nominate the deputy speaker. The very same process that I'm speaking to right now, it's what is going to happen in the National Assembly, where the Chief Justice tomorrow will swear in all the members of the National Council of Provinces. And thereafter, he's going to also proceed with and chair the nomination of the chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, and thereafter the chairperson will then sit in and preside over the swearing, uh, over the nomination of the deputy speaker. So ladies and gentlemen, please be tuned in tomorrow as we are going to also continue to see all these proceedings unfolding of the swearing in of the members of the National Council of Provinces. Indeed, back to the Chief Justice. The Chief Justice actually arrived here yesterday just to make sure and assess that everything is ready for today's event. So as you saw the proceedings unfolding, so now before we go to, to the before we go to the interview with Tim Gossi, we are going to see the Chief Justice giving us an interview of what role he played in ensuring that today's proceedings ran smoothly as we saw at home. Chief Justice, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Um, we are from Parliament Television. We are here to educate the public. We request you to kindly just uh, take the public through as to the process from the elections towards the establishment of the term of Parliament. Nobody who does not meet the qualifications for becoming a member of parliament or the provincial legislature deserves to find his or her name on the list of those who are to be sworn into office or to whom an affirmation of office is to be administered. Therefore, as soon as the elections have taken place, it behooves the IEC to hand over the list to the Chief Justice so that together with the um, parliament, where the swearing in ceremonies would be taking place, they can embark on an exercise of ensuring that everybody to whom an oath or affirmation of office is going to be administered does meet the constitutional requirements for belonging to such an august body. That would explain why on the 15th of uh, this month, at Constitution Hill, the IEC commissioners and executives came to hand over the list of members of parliament and the list of members of the provincial legislatures to me, which I in turn handed over to officials and the uh, chair of the NCOP so that they can embark on an exercise of ensuring that all the logistics are in place um, for the purpose of swearing in ceremonies. And what has happened was, because the Constitution places the responsibility on my shoulders to determine the date for the swearing in of members of the National Assembly, and also to preside at the first sitting of uh, the National Assembly, the National Council of Provinces, and the provincial uh, uh, legislatures, what I have done was to determine the date on, on which this was to happen. The date for the first sitting of the National Assembly, the determination of the date for the first sitting of the National Council of Provinces, 
and the provincial legislatures in consultation with my colleagues. But what I have also done was to designate a judge's precedence to do that which the Constitution says I should be doing. In other words, to designate them to administer the oath or affirmation of office to members of the provincial legislatures because all these events, except for the National Council of Provinces, will be taking place on the same day. Now, what, will, what I have just done today is what my colleagues are going to have to do, which was to swear in or administer an oath to those who would be involved in the electoral process should elections happen. After the swearing in of the members of the, the national legislature, maybe I should start there, and it applies to the provincial legislatures as well. The speaker must be elected. And there is always a possibility that we may have more than one name. If it is one name, it doesn't matter, because then what I will do is just declare that uh, candidate uh, officially elected to whatever position it is. But if we have more than one name, then um, we run elections, very much like the, the IEC. By secret ballot, there will be voting, there are booths the same way that uh, you know elections, national and provincial elections happen and then uh, there will be a county. So this is my IEC, so to speak, to whom an oath was administered uh, today, a total of about 28 people that I'm going to be working with. The same process is embarked upon by the, by the provincial legislatures in terms of the rules. And those rules in terms of which the swearing in and the elections happen are um, are made by, by the Chief Justice. They have been in place, but what I do is every year I revise them. I just revise them and then uh, I cause them to be, to be gazetted so that whoever is interested to know what the regulatory framework in terms of which this process will be handled is can, uh, can access them with, uh, with relative ease. Half past 10, in terms of the Constitution, I'll be presiding. Uh, to administer the oath and thereafter to elect the speaker. But I don't have the authority to preside over the election of the deputy speaker. That authority belongs to or resorts to uh, under, the, under the speaker. She's the one who will be presiding. He or she is the one who will be presiding and then the deputy speaker will then be once that process is over, the Constitution requires of me to take the chair again to preside over the election of the, of the president. And the procedure is basically the same. It's one nominee or one candidate, then I declare the person a duly elected. If it's more than one, then we will have to hold the, the elections. That is what the Constitution requires of us. And the same process, so the same procedure will be followed at the, at the provincial level. The president and the premiers will not be able in law to commence with their official duties unless an oath of office or an affirmation has been administered to them. And that's important. It says to us, an oath is not just part of the traditional ritual that people must go through as a matter of course, no. It has a very critical significance. That is why you can't do anything, although duly elected, relating to your official responsibilities until you have been cautioned about the nature of the office you are about to assume and the critical responsibilities that go with it, all intended to redound them to the good or the benefit of the broader public. So that is what uh, the, the Chief Justice and Judges President representing him or her is supposed to do. Administer that oath 
And once the president or the premier has been uh, sworn into office, then and only then are they in a position to announce who the deputy president is going to be, who ministers are going to be, who uh, deputy ministers are going to be. Likewise, only then are premiers in a position to announce who the uh, who the members of the executive uh, committee are. Before then, there's nothing wrong with them having a thought, but it would be highly irregular for them to act as if they have the authority, the constitutional authority, to uh, appoint people before their authority has been properly conferred on them. It's a conferment of authority. Without that, the exercise, you can never have the authority. You are still watching the live coverage of the first sitting of the National Assembly for the sixth parliament. I am standing here with two of the guests who will introduce themselves and also share who they are with and what are their expectations for this parliamentary term. Well, I am Narus Pambo. I am here with Brianna Pambo and his guest. Well, if all goes well, I hope for the best. You know, not promises, promises, nothing happens. You know, instead, there are no jobs, no land for people to live in. You know, everything is in shambles. But well, I hope after this, it will be better. Um, Zingunabi Salesuha, I'm here with EFF. Um, I'm hoping that um, after this, um, a lot of youth will get um, employment and a lot of policies uh, will be changed and made in favor of women and women empowerment. And is there anything, Mr. Pamo, that you would like to see changing from inside the National Assembly based on the previous experience, from what we have seen previously happening within the chamber? Well, this is my first time in here, you know. If this can improve what has happened in the past, this I'll be happy with. All right, thank you very much, and I wish you all the best for today. We, we, we will now, very soon, we will be returning to the National Assembly, where the election of the Speaker will continue. We are, of course, aware that currently we are sitting with two nominations, one from the ANC, that of Ms. Tani Modise, and one for the, from the Democratic Alliance, that of Mr. Richard Majola. We will be bringing you the live coverage of what is to happen, what will be happening after the election of the speaker and the deputy speaker, and we'll also be bringing you, bringing you coverage of the election of the president of the country. And we are, of course, a beautiful day in Cape Town. We are expecting a lot to happen today. We've spoken to a few new MPs. We've, sp we've spoken to the returning MPs, and we will now crossing back to the studio. Thank you very much, Tim Kose. Indeed, it's an exciting time in the Parliament of South Africa because what we are waiting for as the citizens, as the members that have been sworn in, we are going to wait for the president who is going to be elected as well today. And before the election of the president, we are going to have the election of the speaker as well as the deputy speaker of the National Assembly. Soon thereafter, then the president is going to be elected by all the 400 members of the National Assembly. And Mr. Mansura, welcome back. Right, it's been exciting outside. What is your take as to what is happening outside? Well, the members are waiting in the corridors of Parliament, waiting for the bells to ring again so they can get back into the chamber. Uh, I think uh, most of them have skipped lunch and are waiting <laughs> just to go back in there and cast their vote for their preferred candidate for the speakership. Thank you very much. Just to put the, our viewers uh, on, in, in the processes or on the role as well of the speaker, can you just tell us more about uh, the role of the speaker in the National Assembly as well as the deputy? Thank you very much. Uh, the deputy, of course, deputizes for the speaker when the speaker is unavailable. Uh, but the speaker is the eyes, ears and mouth of the National Assembly. The speaker takes instruction in terms of what the House says. In other words, ensures that the will of the House is carried out. And uh, the Speaker must ensure that the National Assembly is a forum for debate on national issues, 
must also ensure that every party, even the minority smallest parties, are fairly represented in Parliament in a manner consistent with democracy. And in so doing, the Speaker also maintains order in terms of the rules and orders, presides over the House sittings, ensures observance of the rules, and it is incumbent on the Speaker to act impartially to ensure the participation of all members in a manner consistent with democracy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mansura. Also, what we know is that in the absence of both the Speaker and also the Deputy Speaker, there will be other people that preside over the debates of the National Assembly. Can you just tell us more about these office bearers as well as to when will they be elected? Yes, the other office bearers who preside in the chamber would be what we call the House Chairpersons. So we have three House Chairpersons, one in charge of committees, one in charge of international relations, and one in charge of facilities for members. Now they have specific duties, so they work under directly under the guidance of the Speaker or Deputy Speaker, and they report to them, but they assign special functions other than that of presiding officers. In regard to other office bearers, you have, of course, the Chief Whip, of the majority party. Uh, viewers at home, let's cross over to the chamber. You can see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's continue, Mr. Mansura. It's just a picture of what is unfolding in the National mm -hmm. Assembly in preparation for the election of the Speaker. We were on the role of the Speaker as, of the, as well as the, that of the office bearers uh, the as office to bearers. when they are going to be mm. elected. Yes, uh, the Speaker, of course, uh, will uh, elect the, the House chairperson <laughs> are elected by simple majority of the House, so it doesn't require a process as we are going through now. Uh, the chief whip of the majority party is designated by the majority party, so it's not an election process. Then you have chief whip of the official opposition, who is also uh, designated by the opposition. And then you have the important post, that's a constitutional post also, which is called the leader of the opposition. It has a particular function in the House. And then we have a leader of government business in Parliament. Now, the leader of government business brings cabinet business into the House and ensures that cabinet business is dealt with. That position is agreed to by the president. The president will identify who would be this leader of the opposition and inform parliament accordingly. Then we have party whips, of course. Most parties are entitled to whips, depending on their numbers. Mm -hmm. And they are there for this, to ensure the smooth running of the National Assembly. These are members of parliament that are designated by the party also. It's not an election procedure. Uh, and lastly... Sorry, Mr. Mansura, just to interject there, you speak of whips that they are representative of the political parties just to make sure that things run smoothly. With political parties that have one representation, how do they deal with the issue of having a chief whip? We, also, we have a formula. Uh, many years ago, it was eight, eight members will be entitled to one whip. So the smaller parties will group together. So if we have the smaller parties, two, 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 and one, for example, they'll group together and, and be allocated one whip. So every eight members are entitled to one whip, and the smaller parties come to some arrangement in that regard. Okay, all right. Uh, then we have the post of the parliamentary councillor also. There's a parliamentary councillor to the president, and there's a parliamentary councillor to the deputy president. That's nominated by the president and the deputy president, and they come to parliament and to ensure that their principles, the president and the deputy president, are kept informed of all parliamentary activity and that they schedule things on behalf of the president and the deputy president. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a, that's a quite an informative uh, area that you've just mentioned. <coughs> so the president, does he, do, does he appoint them soon after the swearing in? Uh, or, or after the inauguration, how soon are those uh, councils appointed? Those councils uh, will be appointed, of course, naturally after the inauguration. Because remember, when we complete elections this afternoon, we don't have a new president. We have a president-elect. Uh, and that president-elect can only function as the new president, although it would be a continuation in this case, I guess, mm -hmm. 
uh, when inauguration takes place. I think as the Chief Justice mentioned in the previous clip, the President can only carry out those duties once the President has taken the oath of office of President as opposed to the oath of office of the Member of Parliament. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mansour. Uh, another question that relates to, to the Speaker. You would hear more some of the times that the Speaker would say, no point of order, but I would refer the issue to the structures of the National Assembly. What structures does the Speaker refer to when there are no point, when she doesn't want to say a point of order? Well, we have the structure, we have the Rules Committee of the National Assembly that deals specifically with the rules. And if there's point of contestation in regards to a rule, the principle of the contestation goes to the Rules Committee for discussion and for review. We also have another structure called the Chief Whips Forum that reaches agreement in terms of speaking times of parties, in, in terms of what should come before the House. Uh, and that is the structure that has a particular function. And, and if that if the Speaker doesn't rule on the matter, she may refer it to that structure to take care of. We also have the Programming Committee of Parliament that takes decision in terms of the order paper and what comes first, second, and third on the order mm -hmm. paper. And uh, if a point of order is raised in regard to the order of proceedings, Speaker will say she will refer it to that structure of Parliament. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mansour, the election of the Deputy Speaker as well as the Speaker, there must definitely be certain characteristics that they have observed to m actually give a nomination to that particular individual. Can you just take us of some of the characteristic characteristics that an individual needs to possess in order to be able to be a good speaker or deputy speaker? I don't know if there's character uh, involved here, but certainly we have had very, very dynamic speakers over the past 25 years. Uh, we've had p uh, uh, speakers with different characteristics, but each one of them, I think, was had this push to have a good democracy and to give power to Parliament and to hold Parliament's place in the, uh, in the three spheres of government. So I think uh, the characteristic that's most important, fairness, impartiality, participation of all political parties, and the willingness for the democracy to grow. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansoura. Uh, viewers at home, they're crossing back now to the chamber with the proceedings that we had this mo morning. This is a continuation. You might remember that in the morning when we left, the Chief Justice has just entered the Assembly, the National Council of uh, the National uh, Assembly for the continuation of the first sitting that we had this morning. Remember that this part, it is where then they are going to elect the Speaker of the National Assembly. Because we have two nominations, then the voting has to happen. So the Chief Justice is getting ready. You definitely have seen the ballot boxes there in the, in the space that is there. And the members are going to come and vote in groups of 10 and in an alphabetical order. We are now resuming the proceedings. An assistant returning officer will show that the ballot, ballot boxes are empty and close them while we're watching. Please make sure that nothing is hidden to anybody. We, we are all satisfied, is it not? We have seen very well. The procedure to be followed is as follows. Members will be called in, in alphabetical order according to their surnames. When their names are called out, may they please collect a ballot paper from the voting table. And after collecting the ballot paper, each member is required to proceed to one of the ballot booths and make a clear cross in the box 
alongside the name of the nominated candidate or member of his or her choice. After making the mark on the ballot paper and while still in the booth, members should please fold their ballot papers in a way that the official mark can be seen by the returning officer at the ballot box. After the returning officer has noted the mark on the ballot paper, members should please deposit their papers in the ballot box and resume their seats. The returning officer will now call upon members as announced to come and vote. Abram Speedy Makoro, Abrams Alexander Lillian Amelia, Adams Rachel Cecilia Adunz, Nombulusa Lutleris, April Hendrik Jovina, Aries Leticia Heloise, August Sean Najo, Bagram Michael, Babela Kupeng Orbet, Bason Leonard Shane. Bachman Darren, Besani Sibongile Jeremia, Bilangulu John Sengani, Bilangulu Sensani Cage, Brit Tamarin, Reichenbach Glenis, Rink Silier, Bongo Bongani Thomas, Boroto Matara Grace, Boshoff. Weynard Johannes. Otis Alvin Pozoli Belinda Butelezi Elfas Mpagazeleni Butelezi Mangosu Tukaja Kachalia Khalib Kane Yusuf Kapa Ndumiso Kapa Rosemary Nogosola Kado Michael John Kebekulu Russell Ntigayezwe Kele pego wake Hamilton, Kaza Kanya.
Shabani Moses Steve, Chabangu Makusini Mishak, Cheti Murgan, Chikunga Lydia Sindiswa, Chirwa Naledi Nukanya, Clark Michelle Odette, Preeti Barbara Dallas, Cuthbert Matthew John, Kwele Siobonga Cyprian, De Freitas Manuel Simo Franca. Develius Jan Node, Didiza Angela Chokovile, Dilil Patricia, Zikali Masifa Kotlara, Zireko Zikeledi Rosemary, Dirk Mervyn Alexander, Jo Mosibongise Ni Maxwell, Lamini Batabile Olive, Lamini Dora Dunana, Lamini Masha Zingis. Lamini Sadumo Mongeni, Dlamini Zuma and Kosazana Clarice, Dlakudi Doris Yunis, Dlodlo Ayanda, Dululani Beauty Nombuzo. Dunjua, Mary Ann Lindewa, Dianti, Pumza Patricia, Dianti, Kubudile Richard, Faber, Willem Frederick, Faku, Zukisa Cheryl. Cedric Thomas, Frolic Cedric Thomas, Khalo Madlenkosi Philip, Ganjo Mabiza, Gadi Godric Ahmed, Khela Anna, George Dion Travers, Gina Nomalungelo, Gomba Matsiviso Melani, Gondwe Mimi Mata.
Gordon Fervin Jamnadas, Graham Samantha Jane, Hunewald Ignatius Michael, Hunewald Petras Johannes, Kumbi Sanganani Sipelele, Kumbu Philippi Thomas, Kume Jesibusi So Nigel, Kungubele Mondri, Kwarube Siviwe, Hadebe Becky Matthews. Hanekom Derek Andre, Hendrix Muhammad Hanif Ibrahim, Hicklin Madeleine Bertine, Hill Lewis Jordine Gwain, Hina Nangleba Ibrahim, Tengwa Magdalena Tutuzile, Tengwa Mkulego, Tongo Altias Tembile, Tongwa Bavelile Toria, Sonyana Konzi and Togos of Fortunate. Olomisa Bandubonga Harrington. Olomisa Sango Patekile. Hussein Mohammed Hanif. Horn Werner. Hasinga Christian Hans Henrik. Ishmael Hassan, Hassan Nabanu, Jacob Faiz, Jacobs Kenneth Leonard, James Jojo Hubert, Jeffrey John Harold. Jumat Peterson, Tina Monica, Jordan Heloise, Joseph Dennis, Julius Jack Warren William, Kese Kuti Peter, Kekana Pinky Sharon, Halipa Tanutolo David, Tanyile Tembisile Angel, Kaula Makoti Sibongile, Kibi Miriam Tenjiwe. King Chantal Valencia, Kivit Noxolo, Kodua Kadiso good enough. Kola Diane. Homani Rosina Fetsana. Kurano Gerardus Willem. Kopani Semachaleng Patricia. Career, Hendrik Christian Crawford, Krumbok, Gregory Rudy, Kubai and Gbani, Mamaloka Trafosa. Rebecca Nomsa Josephina, Kulas Vusiso McDonald, Guangguang Abayomzi Lawrence Saziso, Lamula Ronald Ozi, Langa Sogozani Makosonke, Gies Robert Alfred, Mekwasa Limalo Innocentia, 
Dekota Musiwa Gerhard Patrick, Lesoma Regina Mina Boseng, Lesati Juba, Bo Betha. Let's see Walter Tibucho, Lorima James Robert Won, Lotit Aneli, Lubengo Marubini Loren, Tuli Begizizwe Nivan, Luzi Posashulene, Make Jerome Joseph, Mabe Bertha Peace, Mabena Tamsanga Begokwake. Mabika Mandlane Koti Zixelo, Mabilitsa Mardi Dorothy, Mackenzie Cameron, McPherson Dean William, Madisha William Motipa, Mandlane Kozi Brian Sindele, Mafanya Washington Seko Isaac, Mafu Nokawe Nonsido, Magazi Dekelede Philistus. Maka kaili to Elvis, makwanishe gratitude, mahambe sala tandi, masalela amos fish, masazi Kathleen Divulelo, masaulu mikatego golden, maso mtakungwe Patricia, maso mbangiseni David, mahuma pelo, supra uba king Ramirezi, my man is Musi Alosius. My name Majodina Pemi Castellina Pamela, Majola Figile Zakaria, Majola Tembekile Richard, Majosi Zandile, Makubela Mashele Lucizo Sharon, Makwetla Samson Fatahe, Malaji Tulukelo, Malazi Moba Solomon, Malema Julius Silo, Malinga Valencia Chogozil. Malumane, Vuisile Promise, Maluleke, Voitumelo, Mama Bolo, Jacob Boy, Manamele, Faridi Buti, Mananiso, Jane Seboletwe, Mandela, Zuele Velile, Mandle Sizwe, Dalibunga, Maneli, Bois, Makosonke, Manganie, Jane, Manku, Lisa and Kosinati, Mantash, Priscilla Tozama. My dad is Samson Gordon. My piece of Makula, not if you are an old tando. 
Mapulani Mutopi Philemon, Mariah Eric Johannes, Mares Eric Johannes, Mares Sarah Jacobus Francois, Maruo, Maruo Tandisiwel Machau, Tandisiwa Linen, Masango Bridget Staff, Maseko Jele Numatemba Hendrieta, Mashabela Wanama Kweta Reneilwe, Mashiko Mfana Robert. Mashiko Dlamini Kwati Kandit, Mashele Timothy Vic. Oko Phineas, Masondo David, Masondo Tabile Sylvia, Masaule Godfrey Pumulo, Maswangani Mkakani Joseph, Matafa Oscar Masarona, Matale Castle Charlie, Matebula Elphas Fani. Matias and Taco Sam, Mazoni Natasha Wendy Anita, Baba Matandega Muruku, Mbata Simpiwe Trail and Omfula, Balula Figile April, Boeni Tito Titus, Mbele Zakel and Jabulo, Mbingo Kika Babongi with Priscilla, Buyane Simanga Hepi. McDonald Lawrence Edward, McGlewer Joseph Job, Nkunu Edward Senzo, Nkunu Tembeka Buyusili Buyusili, Ndaba Sibusisu Welcome, Mente Ntumbo Buyu Veronica, Meshwe Kenneth Rasalabi Joseph, May Peter, Mfaketu Noma India Kathleen, Ngweba Teliswa. Pauli Mahabo Regina, Mjongo Tepo Winston, Milehem Kevin John, Mkalipi Chengiwe Octavia, Mkachwa Nompendu Lotobile, Mkize Chengiwe Bushe, Mkize Zuelini Lawrence, Mkwanazi Jabuli le Cynthia Nightingale, Mlenzana Zola, Mutie Tabo Wilf Nelson. Mwache, Raishibe, Martha, Modishe, Mole Boheng, Modishe, Philip Matsapole, Pochiso, Modishe, Sandy Ruth, Muela, 
Desmond Lawrence, Mofoking, Jacqueline Motlachomang, Muhammad Isamuddin, Moshlala Mathibe Rebecca, Mokause Mabato Olive, Mokoto Sally Mochehoane. Mukwena le sa khona lo kudo mukwele tebo go Josephine mulala le siba Ezekiel mulaekwa Matide Asnas muloi Bujimelo Elizabeth muntuedi mutsuzi Kenneth Murad Seta patamedi Ronald murolong Itisen Kenneth mutaung Anastasia Mutawung Nomasondo Evelyn, Moteka Pebane George, Motsipe Siliesta Catherine Shoana, Motsecha Matole Seforo, Motsecha Matsie Angelina, Motswaleti Pakishe Aaron, Mpambo Sibuana Tandi Gloria, Mbaza Terence Kumbuzo, Mpiti Luyolo, Mpumza Gordon Sinikaya. Sani Timbi Porsche. Msi Veronica Zanele. Nsimang Christian Temba, Ntembu Alice Slebani, Ntembu Jackson Mpiwa, Ntenjane Jumisani Fani, Ntetwa Emmanuel Nkosinati, Mulawuzi Chilibali Elfas, Mulder Cornelius Petrus, Mulder Frederick Jacobus. Munyai Tsilizi Bethuel, Mutambi as we hang with faith, sorry, Mvana Nongosi Quini, Mieni Ernest Tokozani, Ndaba Claudia Nontasha, Ndabeni Abrahams Stella Temisa, Ndozi Mbuiseni Quintin, Ngobo Sibongiseni, Ngobo Siposetu Lindingosu, when you tell us the blessing. Ngwezi Tolani, Ngabani Nobushe Pamela, Ngwani Mashabani Maite Emily, Ngosi Begi Zwe Simon, Nkosi Duma Moses, no Tata Batkolili, Babongili, no Luchungu Nontando Judith, no Ntele Ngetisi, Ngola Kola,
Ms. Langwini, Elsevi, Natasha, Ntobongwana, Nolita, Ntombela, Madala, Louis David, Nshaveni, Kumbuto, Poppy Silence, Nshaisha, Lulama Maxwell, Ntuli, Makoni Maria, Nyonso, Nzwanele, Nzimandi, Bonginkozi, Emmanuel, Nzuza, Nzabulo, Beka, Nkese, Tembelani, Walter Mate, Tulas. Mumalum Chokos is in Kululeko, Olifan Mildred Nelisiwe, Opperman Gisela, Pambo Buyani, Pando Grace Naledi Mandisa, Babo Anthony Hope Mangwana, Patrian Tibogute, Paulson Mohammed Mohammed Nazia, Peacock Dowling Patricia, Peter Zamukolo Joseph. Peters Elizabeth Dipour, Pasha Matume Joseph, Phillips Cheryl, Piri Carol Mohadi, Tilane Majake Mahataso Charlotte Chana, Powell Emma Lewis, Kaiso Polisile Shinas, Khadebe Begizizwe Abraham, Khadebe Jeffrey Tamsanga. Ramadwa Matonzi Miriam. Ramaphosa Madamela Cyril, Rose Adian Christopher, Sarupen Asho Nick, Shreiba Leon Amos, Siabe Albert Mamuha, Self James, Sichulu Isaac Silu, Simenya Machweni Rosina, Shabalala Lizi Figelepi, Shabalala no mvuzo Francisca. Shabangu Susan, Sharif Nazli Khan, Shalembe Malik Yake Lyman, Shembele Henry Andres, Shivambu Nico Floyd, CBC Christopher Howard Nzwake, Sibia Tutuzile Patricia, Sitwai, Nomade Wuka, Nomade Wuka, Nancy, Sindani Patrick Singnarin. Sisulu Lindi Wenongaeva, Sitole Ketamabala Petros, Siwela Elvis Polwana, Siwela Violet Sizani, Siwea Hulani Rulani Tembi, Siwisa Anatleta Matapelo, Skosana Njimani Jim, Kwacha Mtwebisi, Sokacha Nkolisa Simon, Somyo Sakumzi Stoffel,
Swanti, Nokulunga, Primrose, Sotiu, Makoto, Magdalene, Spies, Eleanor, Rochelle, Jacqueline, Steenhuizen, John Henry, Stein, Annette, Stockgang, Stock, Dikgang, Matthews, Sukas, Marie Elizabeth, Swart, Steven Nicholas, Swart, Bernice, Tarabella Machesi, Nomsa Innocentia. Her Blanche Oket Stephanos, Tembewa Sophie Susan, Tring Wayne Maxim, Tito Lorato Florence, Tomelang Kitumezi Bridget, To Muluku Megi, Tola Shenoguzo Lazedis, Teke Grace Kekulu, Teki Mohata Alfred, Sinodi Solomon Lichisa. Shamalala Judith, Chwaku Mkini, Chwete Busisiwe, Chwete Pamela, Pandam Pumzi Le Selma, Pander Merve Lizel Linda, Pander Valk Desiree, Pan Dyke Veronica, Pan Minen Benedicta Maria, Pan Saren Philippus Adrian, Walters Thomas Charles Ravenscroft, Walters Michael, Weber Anneri Maria Magdalena, Vessels Hota Bainand, Whitfield Andrew Grant, Winkler Hannah Shamima, Wilson Evelyn Rain, Taba Busumuzi Cyril, Taba Chaba Pilisile Priti, Tasa Fikile Devilius. Kasa Chogozile, Kreko Sheila Chamberlain, Yabo Bafuze Sikoelo, Yako Yolisa Nomampodomse, Zibula Beauty Tulani, Zulu Lindwe Daphne, Zuma Audrey Vongile, Zungu Tandiwe Rosemary, Zungula, Zungula Buyoletu, Zwan M. Seventh Joseph.
Are the honorable members who haven't voted but desire to do so? None? Very well. Well, that being the case, I'll ask the assistant returning officers to close and seal the ballot boxes. Have you, is it done? Have you finished? Viewers at home, we just came back. Okay, we just came back from lunch, and also you can see the members of the National Assembly. They've just finished voting for the election of the speaker. And once that has been done, the bells will be rung for five minutes for the resumption. May we, may we rise. Uh, viewers at home, welcome back to the proceedings of the swearing-in of the members of the National Assembly. And that part has been concluded. The next part was a continuation from the morning where then they had to nominate the names of the speakers. And then now they've just completed the voting session where the members of the National Assembly voted for their preferred speaker. So now you've just observed the sealing of the boxes and the table staff was busy collecting the boxes and they are removing them. So Mr. Mansura, who's in the studio with me, is going to take us through as to what is going to happen or what is going to unfold from this point in time. Mr. Mansura, welcome back. Uh, can you just take us to the process that's going to unfold now with the boxes sealed and for them being ready to count? Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's been a long process. 400 members have now cast their votes. Uh, those, of course, are sealed votes. The returning officers will now adjourn together with the Chief um, uh, Justice to a room at the back of the chamber, which is described in our terms as Committee Room S26, I think. And there they will be locked in. There will be security at the doors so no one can enter. The returning officers as you saw them in the chamber, will do the counting. The returning officers do ha have no communication devices with them, so they cannot communicate any results out from that sealed room. And they will count and put votes in batches of 10. Normally we do it in batches of 10 around a big table, and it will be checked by another returning officer. And uh, then we will have a result in terms of who is elected speaker. Uh, once those votes have been counted and the Chief Justice is satisfied, he oversees the whole uh, operation, he stays in the room with them, it's on lockdown. Um, the results will then be handed over to the Chief Justice, and if the Chief Justice is satisfied, he will order that the results of the ballot papers received be sealed again. So once he's satisfied, the ballot papers are again sealed, and cannot be opened unless we get a court order. And they are kept at Parliament in a sealed container. Only if there's a court order can we uh, un uh, undo those seals. And those results or those seals, that sealed box must be kept for at least a year at Parliament. So there's any litigation going on, any, any mm. court case that results from it. Chief Justice will then emerge 
only him having the results, all other returning officers stay in the room besides those that are needed in the chamber, one or two of them. The rest stay in there until the announcement of the result. Okay, Mr. Mansura, we know that the, all the members of the National Assembly, their first uh, alliance and loyalty lies with their political party. So in terms of the voting, do they have a choice at this point to say they can abstain or they can decide not to vote? That's what I'm trying to get at. Do they have that freedom not to vote, as experts said? You know, it's a moot point that you make here. You say they have the first priority to their political party. Mm. I contest that they have their first priority mm. to, the, to the laws and constitution of the country. And that's why they've taken the oath of office. Mm. And a lot of people will say you have equal responsibilities to the party and to the constitution. I still say you have responsibility to the constitution and then to the political party. Now, in very, very few occasions have we allowed a free vote in parliament. But this, it doesn't matter in this instance because you will not know how people voted. You cannot know until it's taken to court. That's, that's why we have a secret vote for the election of the speaker, the deputy speaker, and the president. So you may vote out of conscience in this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on the issue of um, the results, will the, will the Chief Justice be the one making the announcement again of who the speaker is going to be? Yes, it is. The, the Chief Justice will be, uh, uh, will be presiding and he will read the result. And then, of course, what will follow is the speaker taking the chair, as you mentioned earlier. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansura. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers at home, uh, to everyone that is watching the live broadcast from the National Assembly, we are going to unpack later on as well the appointment or the nomination and the election of the deputy speaker, as well as the election of the president of the country, because that as well has to happen in this first sitting of the National Assembly. Mr. Mansura, the processes now of electing or nominating the, the, the president of the country, do they follow the same pattern as well? The next two follow the same pattern. Remember, next we'll be doing the deputy speaker, and of course with the speaker presiding in that instance. But the very same procedure as we have now will apply to the next, to the deputy speaker and to the president later. Quite an interesting day, viewers at home. Uh, one of the things, Mr. Mansura, that I noted as I'm walking through the precincts of parliament, funny enough, it's the first time that I saw that. I saw that the, the president, current president, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, actually adopted the constitution of the country on the 8th of May, 1996, with an 86 uh, majority as he was the chairperson of the Constitutional Assembly. And then yet again this year, we are having the elections on the 8th of May, 2019. Do you think it's a coincidence that he, they chose the 8th of May? 8th of May has been a popular day. Mm. It's been a popular mm. day for many elections. We, we try to center it around that time of the adoption of the Constitution. Mm. Of course, you know that the first democratic parliament met two years before, in 1994. And then members have the dual responsibility of being members of parliament and members of the Constitutional Assembly. So while they did their normal work as members of parliament in 1994, between 1994 and 1996, mm -hmm. they also did this huge, huge public participation exercise in writing the new constitution. And you must have heard how many hundreds of thousands of submissions we had for the constitution. And uh, you will remember also that uh, Minister now Ramakosa was then the chair of the Constitutional Assembly. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, at that point in time, we had a government of national unity where even the opposition parties mm -hmm. were represented in cabinet. Uh, Butalezi was in cabinet, for example. He actually stood in as president for a while. Mm -hmm. Yes, the I president remember was not that. There. Yes. And uh, then the National Party was also represented. And when the Constitutional Assembly met, the deputy chairperson of the Constitutional Assembly was Mr. Ruf Mayer. So they had from two political 
parties, mm. one chair and one deputy chair. And it was a very, very interesting period we went through then mm. between 94 and 96 in drawing up the Constitution. Definitely. Still on the drawing of the Constitution, as you said, you were involved at that time because it's quite a significant uh, document or legislation for the country because any legislation that is passed in this house has to be aligned with the constitution of the country. For you, what was the most uh, significant thing that, thing that you took with you after that exercise of drawing up of the constitution? You know, what came with it was the amount of public participation we had in that time. And if you think of if we had the benefit of technology that we have today, how many more? We would have probably got three or four times as much submissions to it. Uh, the Constitution then, of course, the Bill of Rights, as you know, is clearly will not change much. Mm. But also very interesting in this Constitution is the fact that we built into this Constitution the right that there is a review committee that must function every year and receive mm. submissions. So it's a live document. The Constitution is a living document for us. It's not something that was written in 1996 and remains stagnant. Mm. It has developed and therefore we have the Joint Constitutional Review Committee of Parliament that should receive submissions from uh, the public every year and that then should proceed to say where have we, where can we now enhance this Constitution to make it better. Thank you, Mr. Mansoor. Uh, viewers, you've heard it from the former Secretary of the National Assembly, Mr. Mansoor, who was the Secretary from 1986 up until 2013. He's sharing with us his experience and his involvement in the processes that were unfolding over the period of his employment in Parliament, especially with regards to the swearing in as well as the election of all the presiding officers, including the election of the president. Uh, Mr. Mansour, our constitution uh, elaborates a lot on the processes of the parliament, national parliament, uh, with the two houses, the National Assembly and the National Assembly, the National Council of Provinces. I'm wondering if most of our viewers are aware as to in which chapter in the constitution that really gives these mandates of to the NA and the National Assembly. Can you just give the viewers just an overview of which chapter in the Constitution gives the mandate to the President as well as the members of Parliament? Now you make me look at my Constitution <laughs> again. Because it's been years, of course, Chapter 4 of the Constitution is more, most re relevant here. Constru uh, chapter 4 talks about Parliament itself and the two houses of Parliament, the establishment, how they process, how they elect the Speaker, how they dissolve. Then chapter five talks about the president and the national executive. And of course, the, na the other important chapter that I'd like to point out to members is chapter six, which talks about the provinces and how they are established. Uh, because remember that the National Council of Provinces pays, uh, plays a pivotal role also in our democracy. Uh, we're based on that, what you call the German system. We borrowed this National Council of Provinces from the German system called the Bundestag and the Bundesrat. And uh, we went for the system of representation of the provinces at the national level. So uh, while we come from a Westminster system mm -hmm. of government where you have an upper house and a lower house, the House of Commons and the House of Lords uh, in the UK, in South Africa we have, we had prior to 94, or prior to 94, 83, I think, we had the Senate and the Assembly. Now, the Senate and the Assembly matched the House of Commons and the House of Lords. But we went in 1994 to, uh, 1996, sorry, to establish the National Council of Provinces to bring the provincial interest up at the national level. So we've departed a little from the Westminster system of government, although our traditions and parliamentary procedure is still largely based on Westminster. Thank you for mentioning that. Then in terms of the processes, are there no clashes somewhere along the way because you've got two different systems operating within the same institution? Or have there been challenges? And if you have had challenges, how did you then mitigate those challenges? You're talking about the two houses? Yes, about the two houses. I think that they use different systems. 
No, uh, the, 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 rules, the, the, the rules are the same, but the system of not having a complementary relationship between the NA and the NGOP is sometimes healthy. I think sometimes different viewpoints are healthy. When you have the national going one way and one of the province saying, no, we don't really agree with you. So where we have those disagreements, it's quite revealing because that's what democracy is all about. I think democracy is all about this debate, discussion, compromise. And if you can have debate and compromise coming in all the time, remember the National Assembly is a forum for debate. Essentially, it's a forum where you have opposing viewpoints and people trying to convince each other of their viewpoints. So, so, so uh, adversary is not, adverse opinions is not necessarily bad. And we've had very little adverse relationships between the NGOP and the NA. We do have, in terms of the constitution, mediation. Now, mediation is where the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces don't agree on a particular bill. It then goes to a mediation committee. So there is a mechanism in our constitution which takes care of disagreements between houses. And that, I would say, is healthy disagreement. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, viewers, you might recall that earlier on when uh, Temikoso was outside, he, he spoke to Miss Blitzumi as well as uh, Mrs. Van Damme about the participation of the youth in the processes of parliament. And uh, as we listened to them, there was a plea to say that young people must take initiative. They must participate in the lawmaking processes. But Mr. Mansura, having had these ladies speak about the involvement of the youth, um, what is the role of children in, in parliament? Because remember that as well, they are citizens. Is there a platform for the children from 7 to 14 years old that they can play in the processes of the laws of parliament you know, or of the country? Interesting you ask me that. I have a five-year-old grand nephew, you could call him. He's five years old. When we had the holiday for voting, he asked me, why can't I vote? And he's five years old. So I had to explain to him why he couldn't vote. And he told me, can you ask, tell the president that I want to vote? So uh, interestingly, there is an awareness. And I think I picked up uh, recently that certain schools at the primary level mm -hmm. were, were doing voter uh, simulations, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, at school. And I think it's important that we concentrate on bringing democracy in at the very early stages of childhood development that they know what democracy is about, even in a play way. I think we used to, at one stage, have comic books that we used to give to the uh, primary schools to show them what democracy was about, tell it in pictures, in other words. And I think if that is not happening, maybe it needs a revival, maybe parliament together with the IEC needs to carry out a program to revive participation and education at primary level at schools and even include it in the curriculum at a higher level. Thank you very much. Uh, citizens, the South Africa and the Constitution belongs to everyone. And what we have seen happening in the precincts of Parliament today is to say every South African is represented through their different political parties. And what is unfolding today is the work of a whole year where the administration of the staff of Parliament has actually put together this program, not even the program, but the, proce the processes to ensure that everything goes to according to plan. But Mr. Mansoura, yesterday we also had, and even today that, like the members of the National Council of Provinces that might, they are, are going to come, and the members of the National Assembly that were sworn in today, they were going through a long process yesterday. What was that all about? just to catch up on what Mr. Castle said earlier on. Well, members come to Cape Town. It's a strange environment. I think, if I heard correctly, we have more than 50% new members. And those members need to adapt to what happens at Parliament. It's a very strange environment. Uh, it's very unique. So the first thing that when, when members land, we try to make them feel at home. Uh, we bring them into Parliament. We have to do a registration for them. Register each member, each dependent of a member, know who they are, uh, and know. And then we've got to put them in offices in Parliament. Then we've got to provide 
housing for the Nepalmen because 90 percent of them come from outside Cape Town and we have parliamentary villages and those parliamentary villages must be ready to accept them and to house them for a while. Now that is, we do that in cooperation with the Department of Public Works because Public Works they care houses. We've got to look at transport between Parliament and the homes. We've got to provide enough sustenance for those members. We must assume that they're coming here and they've left their job and they're coming here for the f uh, for to 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 set up a temporary home in Parliament. So all those registration processes must go through. Uh, we've got to find out whether they want to take the oath of solemn affirmation. Uh, so there's a lot of administration that must go into uh, uh, into bringing a new member here. We, c we can go on further in the next few weeks, of course, as you know, in terms of an induction program. Maybe you want to talk about that later. But getting them here now to Cape Town, getting the speaker elected, getting the deputy speaker, electing the president, and remember it's a president-elect, the president only becomes the president at inauguration on Saturday, and then getting these members of parliament, 400 plus 54 of the National Council of uh, Provinces, back to Johannesburg for the swearing in on Saturday. Thank you, Mr. Mansour. And viewers at home, Mr. Mansour has just given us or left us on a note that the president is going to be sworn in after the president has been elected in the National Assembly. Most of us at home and everywhere in South Africa, we're quite aware that the, the inauguration of the president is going to take place at a Loftus Rothfeld Stadium in Pretoria, and they are expecting a lot of citizens to make their way there. But one of the most important things as well that we need to recall is that or to remember is that there is no official sitting that is going is happening in parliament currently until the state of the nation address is made by the state president of the country which is going to happen soon after the president has been sworn in or inaugurated in pretoria i think it's the 20th if i'm not mistaken mr mansour not so 20th or 22nd. Yeah, somewhere there, but we will bring you the correct date to your viewers at home. But uh, interesting as it may be, you as the Secretary of the National Assembly, after the swearing in or, or the first part of each term in your time that you were involved in the National Assembly, what were some of the challenges in terms of carrying out your duties? terms of the sitting of the House? Yes, members are just coming in into the National Assembly. Maybe some of them have never had an experience like the new members that are coming in. What becomes a challenge in order for them just to settle in and then you have to deal with those challenges? Uh, the, the, the main thing was to get members into offices here at Parliament. You know we always are short of offices in Parliament. So to get sufficient office space for members and the support staff was always a challenge. Transport to Parliament has always been a problem. Uh, insufficient parking, for example, in the parliamentary precincts. Then we started to use buses to bring members in from the what we call the parliamentary villages. Uh, and that, of course, proved hectic because to maneuver through the traffic in Cape Town is, uh, is, is horrendous. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, getting members here and then releasing members so late at night because we normally sit till late in the evening and members getting home late in the evenings was always a concern to us. Um, so uh, those were the kinds of issues we dealt with. Of course, we once after 1994, in 1999, the second parliament, it became less daunting on the administration because political parties themselves took over the responsibility of looking after their members. There were structures in place after 1999. So the political parties took much control of their own members. Of course, Parliament still offers an induction program in terms of all facilities that we provide for members and in terms of the rules and orders and how they function as members of Parliament. And that program, I think, will start soon here at this Parliament. Uh, but we have discovered also that political parties need their own sort of induction also. And uh, Parliament, the administration, in terms of the uh, uh, various acts of Parliament, 
facilitate this for political parties to provide uh, this special training for, or induction for their members. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansuka. We'll come back on that induction yeah. to that we're going to share a lot so that the viewers can understand what really unfolds before the members become officially uh, members of parliament and they get into their work. Viewers at home, you might recall that earlier on we said we are the chief justice and the table staff and the members are on a break right now so that they count the votes that we received for the election of the Speaker of the National Assembly. So we are also going to take a break while we await the results of the voting and then as soon as the House is back into the sitting, we'll also be back in the studio. Just take a break and thank you. Now this sitting has been called by me as Chief Justice for the swearing in of permanent delegates to the National Council of Provinces as well as the election of the chairperson of the council. The National Council of Provinces will have its first sitting on the 23rd of May 2019 at 10 a.m. For the first sitting of the National Council of Provinces to take place, each of the provincial legislatures must have held their first sittings and swearing in of members of the provincial legislatures and appoint their permanent delegates. Political parties are entitled to delegates in proportion of their representation in the province. All the permanent delegates will be sworn in in the National Council of Provinces during the first sitting. Those who took an affirmation, please raise your right hand and say, I do. And those who took an oath, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help Once all permanent delegates are sworn in, the Chief Justice will preside over the election of the chairperson of the NCOP, who will then preside over the election of the deputy chairperson of the NCOP. Watch the first sitting of the National Council of Provinces on 23rd of May at 10 a.m. live on Parliament TV or via Parliament's live stream on YouTube. Parliament following up on our commitments to the people, making your future work better. You are still watching the live coverage of the first sitting of the National Assembly for the sick parliament. Behind me is where the official photo of the new members of parliament will be taken. And as you can see, the seats in front are reserved for leaders of political parties. Of course, inside the National Assembly, the counting of votes for the uh, position of the speaker has just been completed, and we would, be, we would soon be waiting for the announcement of the speaker for this sixth parliament. We will, of course, as soon as the members of parliament come out to take the photo, show you around, and try and see if we can have some interview. So stay tuned, and for now, we are going back to the studio. Yes. Viewers at home, as we saw Tim Gossi outside, Tim Gossi is busy taking us through the process that's going to unfold as soon as the members of the National Assembly are sworn in. That building is very significant into the precinct of Parliament. It's one of the houses that was built somewhere in 1985, just after the tricameral parliament was established. The tricameral parliament was the in introduction to the some of the community uh, structures or s communities of South Africa. We had the House of Delegates that represented the Indians, we had the House of Representatives that uh, represented the colored community as well as the National Party that represented the white community. So this house was very important then because most of the decisions that were made in this chamber will always favor the National Party because they were in majority. But also that was a step that was going to lead as well to what we have today as a democratic South Africa. Mr. Mansura, speaking of this building, the National Assembly, what are your fond memories of yourself in this particular building? I think, you know, I've seen many heads of state and many leaders of governments 
I've seen the Queen walking these corridors. But I think the most interesting time for me was 1994. We were used to a, a serene parliament where there was debate, everyone addressed each other courtesy and in a manner that, that, that reflected their conservatism. They were very conservative. It was a very conservative parliament. In 1994, I sat on the floor of the House as a returning officer when President Mandela was appointed and took the oath of office. And that was, to me, the most exciting experience in my life. When President Mandela was name was announced as the president of this country, they were singing and dancing for almost half an hour in the chamber, something unheard of, not only in the floor of the chamber, but in the galleries. And it was something from a conservative sort of a parliament it turned into this exciting, colorful parliament where you were allowed to sing and dance. And that was, to me, the euphoria that the country went through, that the parliament went through, that the galleries went through, was, to me, the most exciting single moment in my career. Oh, that's, I, I, you are, I'm glad you were there. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mansour, we, earlier on we touched on the access to information and we highlighted the issue of television that in your days a lot of these platforms were, were not there. What would you say the impact of radio has been in terms of, of the public accessing parliament information, uh, accessing what is happening in the present of parliament? Radio itself, still I believe, when I was around 10, 15 years ago, was still the means of getting towards most of the people in this country. It wasn't television then, it wasn't the social media, it was radio. And the regional radio programs is what we targeted at that point, because you could get information through to the uh, people in their home languages. And that was exciting for us, that you could transmit to them, you could go and advertise to them, even in the constitutional making process, we had different languages being spoken on different radio stations. I think the radio stations were very helpful then in, in, in moving towards a different language, linguistic groups in this country. Um, of course, what we have failed to achieve in those first few years was to transmit the live recording on TV in the language that were being spoken because we were translating and the translation of that language was going to, in other words, predominantly English was being transmitted on our TV stations because we were translating it here at Parliament first and then pushing it out on the TV stations. And we had a lot of complaints by members saying, our people want to hear us in our voices and in our languages. So that was a challenge going through in terms of languages. We've always had problems in terms of languages. I don't know if it's been overcome now. It is, as we say, democracy is very expensive because you've got to translate it to every other language. But I think Parliament has been successful to a large extent in that regard. Oh, thank you very much. The issue of language is very important. Constitutionally, it's a right as well that you must access information in the language that you are comfortable with. And then how did the language services come to, to the fore in terms of its establishment, in terms of putting measures in place through the parliament, of course, to make sure that all the 11 languages take place? And at who, in which way, if you can remember, that you actually implemented, the, implemented this equality in terms of accessing information? We tried from 1994. Uh, when it came through on the interim constitution, we still had language uh, clauses there. In the 1996, it was then became obligatory on us to, uh, to, to provide services in all official languages. And remember, Cape Town being at the southern tip of the country, very few languages were spoken here, predominantly English Afrikaans at this stage. Uh, and we had to really what we call import language specialists, especially from the north north of the country. So we had to actually import skills into this. And some of them came with tremendous skills. I can remember what who we called Hector Shabalala at that time. I can remember Calvin Dalivolo at that time. And those were, in my, uh, in my opinion, the pioneers 
in moving language forward, Mrs. Keswa, for example. Uh, so we had a lot of very special people at that part, point in time who really made huge, huge strides to ensure that we, we could provide services in all languages to people. Definitely. I'm thinking now that as we are conversing around the issue of languages and also access using technology and the media, the digital platforms that are available, what is the impact of, you, of communication with the members when they are in the constituency offices? Do the cell phones have an impact in terms of giving information out there? What change has it brought to the communities when members are in their constituencies or when members are here in the parliament, Cape Town? I think we've, we, we initiated a huge project called the My Parliament Project at that time where handheld devices, the smartphones these days, was the means of communication. And the My Parliament project was, was targeted towards giving members information at their fingertips. In other words, which committees are sitting, what's the order paper of the day, which questions have been asked. And that information was pumped through by our IT section through the smartphones to members. And that's how we got members to know exactly what was happening. You remember, you will remember that a few years ago we went through a period where meetings were being cancelled at last minute committee meetings. And it was essential that members got that information quickly so they didn't leave home and found themselves in Cape Town when the meeting was cancelled. So there was a huge effort to ensure that members got information on time quickly and effectively. And that's when we started using the, uh, the My, uh, My Parliament project to push information through to members of Parliament. Thank you very much. Uh, viewers at home, we are still going live with the proceedings of the National Assembly where now we are awaiting for the outcomes of the elections for the Speaker of the National Assembly. We believe that any time soon now we are going to be receiving the results of what transpired when the members of the National Assembly voted. And now we are going to also ask Mr. Mansura a few questions around the election of the President. Mr. Mansura, one of the responsibilities of the President, of course, is that he is the as head of state. What then happens to his seat in the National Assembly? Well, you know that the Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa's name appeared on the list as number one yes. on the list. So that's, that's the reason he took the oath of office this morning. Essentially, effectively, as we speak, he's a member of the National Assembly until he's nominated as the president-elect. That will happen probably later this afternoon. So uh, he is a member of the National Assembly. He's one of the 400 members. But as soon as he is appointed as president, he loses his seat in the National Assembly. And that to give effect to the separation of powers. So the executive is separate from the judiciary, is separate from the legislature. To give effect to that distinction, the uh, tripoliticus, as we refer to it, that requires the president not to resign, actually, but he he's effectively, I won't say loses his seat, but he's effectively no longer a member of the National Assembly when he becomes president. Uh, again, through this new process, of course. Um, and uh, although, when we look at the tripoliticus also, uh, we look at the ministers must come from the members of the National Assembly. So while the president is not a member of the National Assembly, 99% of his ministers come from the National Assembly uh, because they must account to the National Assembly and they must be present and must be able to be held accountable in the National Assembly. They must appear in the National Assembly. So they have that. I say 99% because, as you know, the president is allowed to appoint two ministers from outside the National Assembly and two deputy ministers from outside the National Assembly. That's a very interesting thing. 
uh, to hear that actually the president seizes his seat as a member of the National Assembly. So in terms of then the proceedings that happen in parliament or during sittings or during parliamentary questions, who has more authority? Is it the president or is it the speaker? And why not the president? No, certainly it's the speaker that has authority in, the, in parliament. In the National Assembly, the speaker is the highest office bearer. The president comes more or less on invitation to the National Assembly. He is, he has, the president has a seat in the National Assembly. He has a seat reserved for him. But he comes there only when required to answer questions, for example, to defend his budget vote uh, and to make maybe a public announcement on certain issues. But when the president, as a non-member of the National Assembly, comes to the House, he is bound he or she is bound by the rules of the National Assembly. So every rule that's in our rule book applies to the president when the president enters the National mm -hmm. Assembly chamber. Thank you so much, Mr. Mansura. Uh, viewers at home, we are just going to step outside of the studio just to see what is happening inside of the chamber, rather. Oh, the, timing of that, <laughs> the timing is up to Viewers at home, you have just seen beautiful scenes of singing and dancing. Mr. Mansura, you've got something to do with this because we just had a chat about the singing and dancing that happened in 1994. And then suddenly, the members of the National Assembly, they actually leave that. So as Mr. Mansura was saying, this was the first in the National Assembly in 1994. Uh, familiar faces there. I know that gentleman, is it not Ringo, the one you see, uh, Sondela, uh, is now a member of the EFF. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and viewers at home, members are settling in, being jo in a jovial mood. Everybody's awaiting the outcome of the voting results, as we saw earlier on the table staff uh, cleaning up and collecting the sealed boxes to a room that Mr. Mansura mentioned, that it's within the precinct, just behind the National Assembly. As you notice there on your screen, on your left-hand side at this point, that is where the majority party sits, which is the African National Congress. And then on your right-hand side, it is all the opposition parties, but partly and some of the members of the National As of the ANC. Right on the front, on the le on the right hand side, just after the black chairs and the rail, that is the biggest opposition party that is represented in Parliament, which is the Democratic Alliance. Uh, people are eagerly awaiting. Others are on their cell phones, sharing the good news, I guess, with their loved ones or whoever. And then there, viewers at home, everybody is singing again. But this is where the Speaker of the National Assembly is going to be announced by the Chief Justice. As soon as the Chief Justice announces the name of the Speaker, remember we had two nominations and one of them, that is the Minister of uh, South African National Services. Uh, that is Mr. Peggy Pele. And back to the chamber, as soon as the Speaker takes her seat, then she will preside over the nomination of the deputy speaker of the deputy speaker of the national assembly that is us in parliament mr mansora you occupied one of those uh, chairs at some point yes. in your life <laughs> yes no those chairs in front of the speaker's uh, chair there is where the uh, 
the, the, the clerks of the house, call it the clerks of the house in, in the West Vincent term. We call it the table staff, as you call it, the table staff. So that's where the clerk sits. And of course, the duties of the clerk is to advise the presiding officer uh, in an impartial manner also, not being part of the chamber itself. That's why we have that raised platform. We don't, the, cl the clerks don't sit on the same level, or the, preside uh, or the uh, table staff don't sit on the same level as members to distinguish them that they are not members of parliament, and therefore they are robed also. Now you would recall, you remember that the, uh, the uh, table staff are robed. They wear a robe. Yes. They wear an advocate's robe normally. Uh, the speaker in most Westminster countries also wears a robe. Uh, they used to wear wigs also. They don't wear the wigs any longer. Um, but they've insisted that the uh, speaker, Speaker Jinwala and all speakers after her, have insisted they will not be robed. They will want to be identified as elected representatives, and that's why they sit on this on, on the speaker's chair unrobed. They have the right, we had uh, occasion to talk about the robing of the speaker and the deputy speaker, but they decided to sit there to show that they part they are the general public, but uh, elected uh, representatives, but the clerks will stay in their robes to show that they are not members of parliament. Oh, thank you. Uh, viewers at home, you've just been given an overview as to why the presiding officers of the National Assembly, uh, we we'd no longer see them in gowns because of a position that they take that they are public representatives and then they appreciate if they come in their own uh, attires into the uh, National Assembly. The excitement and the singing is still on in the National Assembly while we are getting ready for the results. Ladies and gentlemen at home, these are the members of the ruling party. They are having a chat and they are laughing while everybody is looking forward, I guess, to the results that are going to be announced soon. Uh, Mr. Mansura, we are seeing a symbol just above the seat of where the Chief Justice was sitting, which is going to be the seat that is going to be taken by the Speaker of the National Assembly once the results have been uh, delivered to the members. Can you just take us through that if it comes back again on the screen?